Welcome back, everybody, to the Mindful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And today we got a threesome going on in the studio. And this is the the first time (laughs) we've had three people in here. And I'm actually kind of digging the setup. So we got Jesse and Tash, two of the key individuals that were responsible for the film dropping April 23rd. That's the first public is dropping, yeah. Is that the one up in PG? Yep. Okay. And then it will be, I'm sure, at some point shortly thereafter, more widely available. The film is called Transmission. And the film primarily focuses on the transmission of Movi between domestic and wild populations of sheep. And that's about as detailed a description as as I need to give. And we're going to talk about the film a little bit, how the film got made, why the film got made, and maybe more importantly, what we hope the impact of, of people seeing the film will be. So maybe I'll throw it over to you. Jesse, and give us some some background on this project. Um, yeah, so we were approached initially by the Wild Sheep Society of BC back in 2019. Um, they essentially came to us and said, "We have this. Uh, we want to we want to raise awareness about Mycoplasma ovinomoniae. It's a disease amongst uh, domestic sheep that spread to wild sheep, and it's devastating to the wild population." So um, they didn't really. Um, know what the film would be. Neither did we. They just said, we need to raise awareness about this. Please dig in and, and let's figure this out. So that's what it was. That was the direction we got. And that's how it kicked off of raising awareness about uh, this disease. And so what what are the next step there? Like I'm, I'm assuming the first part is you need to organize some funding. Yeah. So there, that was the, I mean, initially the society came and said, you know, let's figure out how we can pull this together. Um, that's kind of a good ethos of the Wild Sheep Society is it's let's find the projects and then we'll, we'll find funding as we need it. Yep. And we'll, we'll reach out to partners or we'll find grants or whatever it is. And that goes from projects on the ground to, to filming projects that they've done. Um, so we kind of put together a, an idea of, of what we would do um, and then went to them and they uh, pooled together money with um, uh, a, a bunch of partners from their end. Um, a, one of the main partners was HCTF, the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, um, and said, go. And said, do... And the, the, we had clear direction from them at the start. They said... We want quality over quantity. We want you to tell the right story and we want you to do the right film. Um, this is ri- like that. I mean, I don't want to say this is rare, but like those are good marching orders to get. Uh, I think Tash said it well when we um, first talked and we first screened with our clients, with Kyle and, and Chris from the society. We said, thank you for being the absolute dream clients, to being patient, to enabling us and empowering us to do what we do best. And that is to dig in and tell the real story, not necessarily the story that that maybe funding or, or funders or partners want to tell. Uh, they said, do the right story and the real story. Yeah. So then from your perspective, you're the producer of the project. How do then you go about organizing your team? What were the next steps on your end? <laughs> Uh, it's really about immersion, like for, so it's all about, like, I spent so much time just getting to know people. Um, I got to know the wildlife biologists, the veterinarians, everybody in this field. And it was just immersion to a level of understanding and then finding out, okay, what are the components and parts and pieces that we can to pull this together? Um, but really it was the main thing was immersion and that, like we said with the society, it's, it's, they enabled us to do that and, and to, to dig into that. Um, we pulled together, you know, that's, that's kind of what Tash and I have done for, 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 for most of our films. And, and what we try to bring to the table is let's start out with a goal and what we're trying to accomplish and then navigate the way and how we're going to accomplish that goal. And, and it was outreach was the main one, uh, that the society put forward. So. Um, putting a team on, we brought on Dan Minsky, um, he's a very talented director, very talented writer. Um, I, I say this all the time and, uh, sorry, Dan, if, if you're getting, uh, sick of me saying it, but I, I, my analogy for Dan is he's my drill bit. So if I need to get to the core, not just like, oh, this is the issue, but like below that and into the core of, of what the issues are or what, a, who a person is or anything like that, then we use Dan cause he's so good at uh at getting in and getting inside and so once you can understand you know how things tick from the inside and how well 
I mean, in the conservation world, as you know, it's very complicated and very complex and it's all gray. There's no black and white anywhere. So then learning how being immersed in that and then learning out how we can communicate that in, in a artful way or in the proper way that justifies how conservation should be told. Right. Um, and Tash, you're responsible for cinematography on the, on the um, piece? Yeah, I was kind of lead lead camera. Um, Jesse shot a fair bit, and uh, we also had another camera uh, operator that went out on um, on one of the first shoots ever. It was kind of just a discovery shoot that uh, he went out and filmed. So, yeah, and I was also the main editor. Okay. Yeah. Now, there's a very clear aesthetic to the film <laughs> that I think rides through the entire thing from, like, font selection to color grading to the style of of each of the shots how much of that was like pre-planned and intentional or was it more of an organic it kind of evolved as the project evolved well i think i'll speak to the branding and kind of fonts and and um you know what our logo is and, and stuff we've we very intentionally our target audience for this is um, film or farmers, not filmers, uh, <laughs> uh, farmers and uh, domestic sheep producers. Um, so, mm. our branding, while funded by a wild sheep society, doesn't have any wild sheep on it. It right. has a domestic sheep on it. We used yeah. um, kind of Western style font. Hundred percent. Yep. Um, and the, and the whole color palette and brand, but with a modern twist, I would say, right. as yep. well. Like it's clean, it's crisp. Um, but definitely like a bit of a bit of a throwback to the style for right, sure. Exactly. It's, it's, um, I worked with a really good designer named uh, Sam Weiss of Forge Creative. Okay. She's really good. Um, she helped develop the concept and ideas. Um, and because I mean, I mean, that's so a big, that kind of speaks to an ethos of my job too, is putting the right people in the right position to empower yep. them to do what they do best. So she helped develop that. And it was, Again, it was all intentional because we want to brand this because our target audience is to the farming community. Yeah, well, and this is this is something me and my business partner talk about all the time. I think people have this mistaken notion that like quality can stand on its own. Like if you just tell a good story, that's going to be good enough. And I firmly believe that in this day and age, it's not good enough. Like mm -hmm. if you don't have that platinum level polish on stuff today the, the the way people are inundated with messaging and branding and imagery like mm -hmm. you're just not going to get through people won't give it like i the analogy i always use is like even a good tv show i usually need a, the first couple episodes to like muscle through mm -hmm. to right. where the characters start to grow on me yeah and i'm not really immersed in it and then by episode two or three i'm like okay you got me i'm here but if the if the production quality is so low that I can't muscle for through those first two episodes, and I think a film like this, there's other low budget versions that haven't told this particular story, but the same attempt at um you know um, bringing you know diverse communities together and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and if it comes across as like a, a yeah it lacks that aesthetic and and it, it should be pleasing to watch and pleasing to absorb and i just yeah. i think you guys nailed that and knocked it out of the park i was really surprised at like i felt like i was watching a feature film thank you yeah, yeah. um i actually feel a little bit not the opposite but just that our films uh, we have a tendency to not focus on um on the big sexy shots as much right we're more about telling the story the content um a lot of stuff is shot handheld kind of purposely because it makes a viewer feel more like they're in, in place. Yes. Instead of setting everything back on a tripod and being, you know, rock solid. So yeah. even a lot of your like second camera interview stuff was handheld, which I noticed, which mm -hmm. I really liked. Yeah. Like it gives it that more kind of gritty, like, yeah. Yeah. Running yeah I gun remember in post production because I shot that second angle and Tash, I had to like, okay, we have to cut to the main interview shot every once in a while because he was just so in love with it. Too. I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's just more intimate, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you yeah. get somebody in profile and you get a little backlighting coming in, yeah. like it's The other beautiful. shot's almost there as as like your safety when you need when you need the perfect coverage. But yeah, yeah whenever we could use those kind of mm -hmm. more personal shots, we would. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I do, and that's why I was wondering if it was more like thought out or if it was just kind of that is the style and, and whatnot because it does it I doesn't feel forced. Right? I think that's a bit our our style as a brand. Right. Um, you know, we didn't, in this film, as much as the planning out, it was, we were just kind of, in the early stages, we were just kind of taking the shoots as they were coming. We'd get a date that something was happening and, and would go there. And, um, 
yeah, there wasn't a lot of like super, uh, there wasn't a lot of intention put into how the style was going to be. It's just kind of how we do things. And, um, but I think it, it all goes together to make a tone that is more immersive and, uh, a bit more personal. Yeah. hundred percent. So give me an idea of scope here. How long did it take? Because there are like some of the stuff you guys were able to capture and some of the events, like mm-hmm. pretty wild. Do you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> some of the things that end up coming full circle throughout the course of the film. And yeah. we get to introduce a concept and create a little bit of tension. And then there's this resolve at the, at the end. And like, it, I mean, how long from beginning to end? Uh, we kicked off uh, June, July of 2019. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that is, yeah. uh, we, we jumped into filming and then COVID hit. Right. So, I mean, obviously with a, a lot of our filming plan was being in people's spaces and and doing things with people we might meet for the first time. Um, and that just wasn't, that wasn't uh, an option with COVID and everything that was happening. So we delayed through that. And then there was that little kind of dip of uh, false hope that COVID was going away and yep. then we could film some more and then COVID came back. So it was just this, this constant, you know, I, all I did was have conversations with people and gauge their comfort level. And, yep. you know, like Tash said, when opportunities would come up, it's like, okay, are we comfortable doing this? Can we go film this? And it just took us that long until uh, October. When did I basically lock you in the Mid-October editing? Mid-October is kind of when we, like, yeah, we had done some editing before that, a uh, little, little um, stints here and there. But mid-October last year was when we, mm-hmm. uh, when, I I, when I got locked I, into I a cage. I essentially, we... We're 50-50 in our business. We okay. do things together as is we are here. <laughs> um, but if, since October, I've been run, basically running the business on my own. Okay. And I've intentionally let Dan and Tash basically just be in the editing room for, what did we say the final amount was, six months? Uh, yeah, much. closer to seven if you include the other Let's stuff. Let's just call yeah. it seven because we'll, uh, that's a better yeah, number. More dramatic impact. <laughs> more dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> We're but storytellers here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always like Tell to say you don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's right. Yeah. Anyways, he's been basically fired from doing anything else other okay. than editing this film. And yeah. kudos to Dan and Tash because, as we were saying at a, a screener event um, last week, they go to the dark places. Right. Dan and Tash go into the like the deep dark and navigate those waters and and what goes where. And Dan would assemble something and, okay, this part goes here. And then Tash would put a scene together and then revise, 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 and just work through all those murky waters to to kind of where we are now. I I think a bit of, uh, just to talk a bit about the longevity of the project, I think it actually ended up becoming a a real uh, bonus more than a curse. Right. Hmm. Because, you know, had COVID not gotten away, we would have probably done all of the filming in six months. Yeah, and then put that together, and because it just kept going, we were like, "Well, you know, shit, maybe we should go grab another interview with Jen on the farm or see what the update is there, or yeah, yeah. different things like that, right?" And it, and it 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 ended up, you know, benefiting the film in the end to be able to tell the story over a longer period of time because things change. There's more developments, mm-hmm. and there's no way it would have felt as rich, yeah, yeah. without yeah, that because because you, you get the sense, and it's not like you drag it out in front of the audience and say, we took three years to do this. But when you just start doing the mental math about some of the things that get introduced and then, yep. wait a minute, we're talking to these guys again and clearly they've been here for a yeah. while because there's some things have changed. Yeah. And yeah. you just start to get a, a you know, there's this, there's this behavioral bias called operational transparency. It's the reason why on your computer you get a spinning pinwheel hmm. or an hourglass because we feel more comfortable when somebody tells us that there's something going on behind right. the scenes, uh, yeah. we're like, oh, okay, they're doing work, so I can, f- it's okay. Right. It's like the progress bar, and then it gets to 99 and hovers there forever, <laughs> and you realize that whole first 99 was BS. Yeah. Um, but I think in a way through storytelling, that's a- almost a filmmaker's way of operational transparency sometimes. Like you're not being tacky about it yeah. with like a, because I thought that was interesting. I'm like, man, they could have really had like, like a counter or a calendar mm. accompanying this and worked into it to give me a sense of scope and scale. Right. But instead, you're just kind of unconsciously aware of it by the time you get three quarters of the way through the film. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that We're, was intentional about being immersed in the story, story so deep yeah. that like locations and time frame didn't really matter. Right. Because we're following this evolution and, and this growth. We're also, I think one of Dan's biggest credits, what makes him such a good storyteller is that 
Um, it's kind of that old theory of what an editor does and what a storyteller does in something like this is you're just removing everything that isn't the story. Yeah, right. So by the time you get to the end, everything that's in that edit is very intentional and serves a purpose. And, you know, something like that um, didn't come up to us as being important. Right. It did, it's not It's not adding to the story. It's, like you said, it might be serving some sort of other utility in the background, but it's not actually pushing the story forward and yeah. or engaging the audience more in any way or anything like that, so... That's why it's not there. <laughs> so talk me through the editing process because I think a lot of people would assume that it's fairly linear. And from my limited experience, I don't find it's that way. I find Super it's, not linear. Yeah, there's like, <laughs> yeah. you're, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, except the actual pieces aren't done yet. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to finish all the pieces yeah. and then figure out. How, so uh, how we did actually you approach had a, that? Like a uh, pretty late, like full scene revision in the film, like up until... You know, like uh, just before Christmas. No, at Christmas. At Christmas was the first time we kind of assembled the full mm -hmm. rough cut. Okay. Other than that, How it was How long was it at that point, just out of curiosity? It was just under an hour and a half. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So and you, we're, you lost we're almost down, 33% of the film. We're at yeah. 53 minutes now, including credits. Yeah. So like Which actual. Which is so perfect because you're almost left wanting more. You're like, ah, oh, that could have been another 10 minutes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So yeah, to go back to it, it it's, you know, it starts on paper uh, beforehand and you kind of map out what the scenes are and what the logical progression is. Yep. And then um, Dan would do a big, chonky, fat rough cut on a scene. So he would okay. send me, he would send me like an hour that I'm going to cut down to uh, 15 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever just kind of feels right. Yep. It's all by feeling at that point. Okay. And then we, and then we watch it. He would watch it and and come back and be like, ah, oh, that one chunk that we took out, I really think it needs to go back. This other stuff's all fat, throw it out. And you just kind of just keep doing that and keep doing right. that and keep doing that. Um, I, you know, I think. I think they call that editing. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think you get to, well, some of these scenes we re-edited two or three times. Some of them we re-edited seven or eight times. Right. Some of them just kind of tell themselves very naturally and, and it was obvious. Other ones you really had to dig for. There was a whole almost 15 minute scene at the end that we just completely threw out because we just felt like. It kind of took too. It lasted too long. The film lasted too long. Got to kill your babies sometimes, man. Yeah, that's yeah, the hardest yeah, thing yeah. to do as an artist. But I think it's also the most rewarding because yeah. it's you yeah. know it when you've done it and it's right. Mm -hmm. And it is just ego that makes you want to keep those like little gems yeah, in there. That's 100%, like they don't yeah. advance the story. Like this yeah. doesn't need to be here. When when I think of myself as a filmmaker, like fifteen years ago or twenty years ago, it was it was that it was that inability yes. to make yes. those edits and be like. You know, I dreamed of this shot, or I dreamed of this yep. transition, and I'm keeping it no matter what because I ha I have such an identity with it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you just get you just learn to try to detach emotionally from any of that stuff and just let the story come through. And yeah, re and, rely and, on instincts and kind for of sure. through, through that process too. It was it was great because of the team we had where Tash was scene work and like the heavy lifting. Dan was not only. Um, looking at the scene in whole, but also positioning within the storyline. Right. So keeping that frame of mind, then I'm coming in with like client expectations sure. and views and like timeline and, and that kind of stuff. So that three, that dichotomy of the three of us all working together, one wouldn't happen without all three of us um, with those. Because there's things that would come up with like the storyline that I'm like, well, we need to communicate this and don't, don't forget this. And, you know, keeping kind of our goal in mind. And then um, Tash and Dan have other things in mind. And it, it was just, it, it it it's work. <laughs> you got to go through those things, and it's not nothing. Nothing along the line is is easy. But it's um, when you're dealing with a, a topic and and something that you know we were filming. All three of us pretty much filmed the whole film together. Okay. Um. So we had connections to those experiences, and and which led to a deeper connection on the issue. One hundred percent. Now, there's a particularly charismatic biologist. Was she like a did was was having her part of this film like something you well, the actual question I wrote until you told me how the thing actually spurred on was was she found and then the film created around her or did you decide <laughs> to tell the story and then just happened upon so you're talking this, about Helen I am so Helen's a veterinarian right so like, sorry different than a biologist I well isn't she called the provincial bi wildlife biologist wildlife vet vet okay yeah, yeah. okay okay yeah. okay. Get your facts straight, Jack. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so the she was the head wildlife veterinarian, so she runs the show. So when there's capture events and when everything, you know, anything to do with wildlife work, she's 
she's the person. Um, and so she's just naturally involved. Right. Um, when we met her and we spent some time with her, we just said, good gosh. Like, yeah. this is, uh, from a filmmaker's perspective, a dream. 100%. Like, characters, right? It's, it's, it's the holy grail. Characters. It's the yeah. holy grail. Like, intelligent, respected, a goofball, a smart ass. Like, yep. she's she's not afraid. Uh, she's... She's she's the true definition of a leader. Yeah. She gets everybody on board and everybody follows. Yeah. Um and she's <laughs> she's just amazing. And so we said, we said this needs to be our central yeah. our central focus and who we need to follow along the way and follow this journey and um it just so happens that she's producing this study um about eliminating it from the from the source. Right. So it yeah. all kind of fell into place. Yeah, Dan. Dan met her on that uh, scout shoot, that original shoot where, um, you know, they're moving. This, these uh, farmers were moving sheep across the province and okay. found out about Movi and wanted to get their their sheep tested. Um, so they, we went out to shoot that. It was Dan, and another camera guy, and Dan called us after the first day of shooting and was like, "Oh, guys, we got to film now." <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. you don't know. Like at, at that point, you're hoping there's going to be great characters. Yeah, you're trying to map them out. We had a few different ideas as far as who would be the main character driving the film, but. Um, yeah, we, we settled on Helen pretty damn quick after meeting her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. I was just hearing somebody talk about documentaries the other day and they said documentaries happen to happen at the speed. They have to happen at the speed of life. And that when you try mm. and force the pace of a documentary, yeah. it falls apart really fast. And I think between like natural findings of, of individuals like Helen and being able to watch the evolution of those, of that couple who moved across the province and being forced into those type of situations. I think that's what I was trying to get at earlier. That gives you such a natural pace mm -hmm. pacing yeah. for the film. Yeah. It's interesting that we actually see their daughter, Ellie grow up in yeah. the film. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. Hang on. I got some, I wrote some questions down and I don't want to forget any. I, I think just to add to that one more little nugget, I, th I think that that's really the difference between documentary and narrative films is narrative. You go in with a very strict plan. Yeah. There's a little bit of exploration while you're shooting scenes and everything. Documentary, you go into it with a very loose plan, yeah. or at least in our mind, if you're doing it right, you go into it with a very loose plan but a lot of inspiration so that when you're in the moment and someone says something or you notice something happen out of the corner of your eye, you're there and you're, and you're ready to get it. And, and I think it just, it deserves another props to um, Wild Sheep Society of BC as client and HCTF because HCTF kept granting extension, extension, extension on grant money because of COVID delays and because of that. So they, they deserve props, but the Wild Sheep Society as a client was completely at peace with that kind of approach. And yep. again, they just kept coming back with like, it's okay, let's just just make it good, make it good. Because we do client work. That's what we do for a living. Yep. And to me, deadlines and goals um, are uh, paramount. And like usually <laughs> most projects get to a point where we fall in love with them, we create it, but then client revisions and expectations just... Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> bring it down. It. Yeah. 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 Chip yeah. away at it. So this is like like you were saying, and you de identified off the top a dream scenario. Yeah, and it I th I think the film that we've produced kind of justifies that dream scenario of. of it's like a patron in the truest sense of the mm. word, like yeah. in an old school, mm. like they're there to support the development of the piece of art, whatever yes. it may turn out to be, and yeah. provide that structure and finance. Very much had that. And, it didn't have a client yeah client vibe at all. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is the best case scenario. Like that's oh, how it's supposed to work. Like, like get yeah. out of the way. If yes. you knew how to do this, you you would. You would do it. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, so yeah. let yeah <laughs> yeah yeah hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, exactly. Now, so we've talked about COVID and obviously that presented some challenges. But there's there's a ton of outdoor filming. There's a ton of events that things are happening at where you have no control over and there's machinery involved and other kind of stuff. Talk to me about some of the technical challenges of of filming a series of events like you had to film in order to get this stuff. Well, I think Oof. driving out to the capture and call uh, field where, where that was all <laughs> happening was an interesting one as was well. It? An ice road that's an hour and a half long and, you know, driving through uh, the mud. And, the yeah. mud. The, so this uh, Ward Creek Ranch where we were at, they're uh, credited in the film and they're very gracious to allow us to work out of there. But there's not much road maintenance that happens no. out in the Fraser River remote area so we're going through mud roads that's 
some of it was like, I don't know if we're going to make it to there. And then yeah. you get there and you're like, okay, well, we made it. Let's, yeah. let's do it. And, um, you know, being out there on location, it, uh, it, it wasn't that cold. It was cold though, but nothing that it wasn't crazy. It, it wasn't like, I thought it was funny. There's one scene where like everybody's done up in parkas and then there's like three native dudes in, in like Carhartt jackets. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, now I understand how cold it is. It's not yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's like, it's cold for those people, <laughs> yeah. but it's not that yeah, cold. Yeah. 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 And like, um, um, I had, we had a generator out there cause we were, we run the red camera. Okay. And that was, that's another question I'm interested in is kind of gear for a typical just shoot, never but. ever buy or use a red camera ever <laughs> but and then you edit with it and then you're like why would i use anything else yeah uh but you know like batteries on the red is a yeah. is a thing so i had the the generator going i had a full like field op uh full support tent set up so that we were charging batteries while we were filming so we could just stay out there and film 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 yeah, we film we film that. It doesn't really come across. You can tell there's some weather changes in in the film, but we filmed that scene across three days. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, the red. You know, we're using six batteries a day basically for a full day. Yeah. And they take two hours to charge each. So <laughs> as soon as one's dead, so, it goes right on the charger. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. the red in itself is is a bit of a beat. It's just big. It's heavy. It's slow startup. It takes almost a minute from the time you hit the power button to the time it's ready to roll. So for documentary, that's not great. Um, right. <laughs> so, you, you know, that's why we run through so many batteries because you just leave it on all day, Yeah, basically. Um, and then, yeah, there's we shot some second camera with A7 and then some of the in- initial farm footage stuff was shot with an FS5. And how do you find color matching challenges between oh those three platforms? God. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, you're, I mean, you're taking a red, which is like, you know, top level cinematography yeah. camera and, and trying to match it to an FS5, which, you know, in its day was a $7,000 prosumer. Yep. Those two are the biggest challenge. It's surprisingly, the A7 and the red match pretty well. Yep. And like, that's what the interviews were shot with. The close up angle was the. Because it, it's seamless. You, oh, okay. you don't feel like yeah. you're moving from like one color grade to another. Like, right. it, yeah, that's yeah. Good. I think color grading uh, alone is a very under um, underrated element yeah. in filmmaking. It's one of those things yeah. that when it's done right, nobody ever notices it, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, exactly. And, you know, to to be to be fair to ourselves, I guess we had uh, as much as it was. Uh, we had a budget. We had a workable budget, okay. but we the crew is basically us plus Dan. Uh, and that's about it. Mike Mike <laughs> Pedersen did the post production on the audio, okay. but we didn't have an audio operator in the field with us. It was us, kind of. So you know, technically, that was actually probably the biggest challenge. Um, you know, in hindsight, if we had a bigger budget, that would definitely be something we would have. Yeah. I would love to be able to to farm out the coloring because. I you know I'm comfortable with it, but I don't love it, and I'm. There's such a difference and, in that field too, and the speed and the expediency yeah. that because mm-hmm. it's a true rabbit hole, man. You could fall yeah. into for hours, and somebody who really understands color science. Yeah, I sat yeah. in with a pro a pro colorist for a day once just to yeah. kind of see and and to get some lessons on Da Vinci, and uh, he would color a feature film in a week in five days. Yeah, five hundred shots a day. Yeah, yeah. wild. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, and that's all. So that's also where you know we decide the film is more more to us than just a regular project where we're willing to put in the extra effort and, um, you know, dealing in the nonprofit world, you're, yep. you know, obviously given limited budgets. Yep. If it was unlimited, it probably wouldn't be called not for profit. So, yeah. um, so yeah, just making those kind of scenarios work. I remember at the capturing call, um, Dan was director and audio guy. Yeah. So we've got pictures of him as director doing an interview wearing headphones and holding the microphone because we we didn't have budget to bring um, right. a field tech out. So, um, but yeah, I think we just we made it. And well, a lot of those, a lot of those situations come up like the capture calls, like oh, it's happening in in two days. Be there. It's like okay, uh, 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 okay we'll be there. We'll yeah. figure it out. Uh, so you just kind of make it work. So, but I think we I think we made it work, all things considering. So. Oh yeah, with without a doubt, man, without a doubt. And let's let's talk about that. You know, there's a there's a particularly emotionally challenging part of the film to watch, and you know, much like the rest of the film, you're responsible for editing it. Now, what's interesting is that there's a, a bit of an emotional struggle going on when you're watching this film because, in order to care about the species as a whole, you kind of have to let go of a few of the individuals, you know what I mean? For lack of a better description. Right. So how do you straddle that line when you're, when you're telling that story? Because 
It's almost like if you build up too strong of an emotional connection for the individual, then you're going to lose sight of right. the fact that this is a population issue and we might need to, you know, lose a few individuals to protect the population. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, there's no um there's no uh, order of operations on that. It's right. it's really just intuition and feeling it. And that was one of the big shuffles is that, you know, originally we had we had that scene later in the film and it felt like it took too long to get to that to right. get to that moment. Um, so it's it's that timing thing and it's everything that happens before that to create the emotional investment so that when that moment happens, it, it has the impact that you're hoping it does, right? And, you know, that's the whole... You don't want to say the, the whole mission of the film is that moment, but it's like our plan going in was we we wanted emotional engagement. That's always what we sort of strive for is is to find a balance of being able to to tell the truth and to tell the science and, and the facts, but to also find a way for people to become engaged. Right. So, yeah, because that, well, I mean, that goes to a basic level of understanding of human beings that, you know, we are emotional, emotive human beings. We are emotional beings. So that's where, you know, and... That's why through the film we tried to make it so that you could also see these scenarios and care about these animals, but through people's eyes. Right. So you can attach to those characters, you can ta attach to those human beings and feel what they're feeling. And that's so, I mean, but it is such a feel thing to how, you, how do you craft these to the certain moment, especially in that scene where it can go dark mm -hmm. and it can go too dark, but yep. not dark enough, but you need just enough darkness to feel yeah. the right amount of thing to be motivated yeah yeah it goes back to that idea of, of removing what isn't the story if we if you mm -hmm. removed that scene uh what emotional impact would that film have had on yeah. you right it's yeah. so you know it's we we're lucky we we're lucky that it happened the way it did that the characters that were in that scene were um uh, they were that emo you're you're going along with them is it you you don't necessarily you don't have any stake in that scene in the moment you're sitting in your living room or wherever watching this watching this film it's it's that you're connected to the characters in that moment mm -hmm. and that they carry you through you're just you're just uh, watching them experience it so now one of the things that I was a little curious about that the film doesn't really dive into is what is the general sentiment from like the ag crowd about about this thing like do, is there this isn't my problem. I don't want another thing that I got to spend money on for my sheep. Or is there general buy-in? Or is it a real mixed bag, depending on where they are? Well, that was my biggest concern going in, is how do you get people to care about wild sheep who probably don't? Yeah. Um, and the discovery and was... And in all fairness, got enough to care. Like, yeah, it yeah. ain't easy <laughs> being a farmer or a rancher to begin with. You yeah, know what I mean? Right, like, exactly. these people aren't rolling in money, yeah. so... Well, then enter Jen and Trevor. Right who voluntarily came out and said, oh, I hear that we might be impacting the wild population. What can we do? Yeah. So generally speaking, and, and like, like I said, I was, I was struggling with that at the beginning, but then you start to get to know people and you get to know that if they're given a reason to care, they will. Right. Um, and in most cases, people, um, if given the right reasons and shown why they should care, they will care. Right. Yeah, and I think it does... I think it does a good job of that. And I think ending on the, like some of the more positive notes that are in the film also help a little bit with that. I think if there hadn't, I think if we'd seen no progression in our ability to monitor this or deal with it both in the wild and in domestic populations, it would leave you with a sense of futility mm -hmm. and then you just kind of right. sense of impotence when you're, when you're done. But it, but it, but it doesn't, you know what I mean? You do feel like, you know, it's, maybe not going to be easy, but there are, there are some options coming online. Yeah. And that's the thing that was so for us and the potential that we realized is that we had the space to actually do storytelling. Right. You know, in, in our filmmaking space, everybody professes that they're storytellers and they're all about storytelling. Um, but with this, we really had the opportunity to take you on a journey, make you feel things, be motivated and understand things and go to a, um, a dark place, go to a light place, feel resolution and hope for what's to come. So again, um, just saying that it's, it's so nice to have a project where we can actually do a story yeah. and lay it out and, and you, you know, kind of go on a journey. Like when I was sending it to you, I'm like, sit down, watch it. It's, it's something it's, and, and, and that kind of speaks to why we're, we're taking this approach with distribution and right. where it's available because this isn't, 
meant and it wasn't built as, you know, it goes on YouTube and I hope you watch it. Right. It's meant as an outreach and awareness tool. So we're, 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 we want to bring people out. We want to have those atmospheres where we can watch the film, be engaged, and then have, um, you know, awareness and talks and conversations with people right after the film, like at screening events and stuff like that. You almost want to curate the experience. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to just somebody yeah. stumbling across it yeah. by themselves. What's the reaction been? For, I'm, I'm sure there's been some people who are in the film who's got to see yeah. the, mm-hmm. the, the kind of early release. What's the reaction been like from people who knew it was being made? Uh, I, it's been, it's been pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and <laughs> for me as the person that sits in a room about this size, like if there was a wall right there <laughs> yeah. for several months, staring at white bricks and editing this film and, uh, not really having, you know, we felt it was good. We showed it to, um, sometimes it's hard though. Cause mm-hmm. sometimes you, I thought shit was amazing. Yeah. Well, even and before, then let it out and I'm like, Oh, and then after a while I'm like, that wasn't very good. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, sometimes it's just tough, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we did something that we hadn't really done before and sent it out uh, at kind of a rough cut stage to okay. a few a few friends and, and yeah. people and stra- not strangers, but people that we knew <laughs> that were like removed from it completely just to right. get completely yeah. unbiased yeah. feedback that kind of helped a bit. And then um, and then, yeah, we showed it to uh, Kyle and Chris from the society and um, that was fantastic. They just had like no no real feedback. I think there were negative feedback the, to offer. I think the the general consensus is that they were blown away. They didn't know, they yep. didn't yeah. know the impact that was in front of them when they started watching it. Yeah. To where they came at the end. Um, yeah, blown away seems to be a a big one. Like, it. So that's why, like, a lot of what we've produced in the past is like. Fishing BC films and yeah. like brand films and, and all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden we come out and try to convey that this is different and this is like, this is a heavy hitter emotionally yeah. uh, because it's it's an, an awareness and, and an outreach tool to a subject that became really meaningful to Tash and I too. I know the two projects have nothing to do with each other, but the, this is the kind of stories that one campfire needs mm. to somehow tell because this is like, related to hunting, but not aimed at hunters. And there seems to be an inability to separate that. Like, I need you to understand me as a hunter. And that's not, Yeah, you don't, I don't need you to understand me as a hunter. I need you to understand that there are things that are important to me that are like things that are important to you. And that if we can both respect that, then we can become allies and help each other protect things that are important to both of us. But that was what, yeah, I'm kind of jaded on on most stuff, and it definitely hit me for a little bit. Like when I sent you the the text, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's very good. Okay, so now that we have this, you know, this masterpiece, what's the plan? Like, how do you? Where do we go from here? I know there's going to be. I kind of. I I would love to drive to PG. I've had a a lot of email correspondence over the last two years with Bill Jex. Yep. I keep trying to get him to come on the podcast, and he he kind of says. Yes, but all the time. Like he's a very nice man, yeah. and I almost feel like he fe- he feels like I. I'm sure there's other people, and I'm like I know. Like I would really like. Anyways, I would love to hear that guy talk about aging. Yeah, and I know that's going on in yeah. Prince George as well. So I know there's that those types of environments. I think and circumstances are ideal for this sort of thing. But what's the what's the release schedule? What's the plan for this thing moving forward? Um, well, first on Bill, I talked to Bill probably once a week, okay. um, all the time, and it was funny when um, and you saw him in the film and what he brought to the film was amazing. Yeah, and that, uh, but I've never even seen his face before. Well, I'm used to just <laughs> getting very few people have three page yeah. emails from the guy. Like I write in like a couple sentences. Like I'm curious about like. Uh, immature ram deaths in the province over the last right. few years. I yeah. want to cover it in my podcast. Yeah. And I'm like, graphs and tables and pages. And I'm just like, we, this is amazing. We literally gave him no choice. We just drove up there. We yes. drove from the Nymo to Smithers and interviewed him and drove home the next day. Yeah. Like, but he said the same thing. I was like, I don't yeah. know what I would contribute to your film. Blah, yeah. blah. And we said, shut up. We're coming up and filming. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, okay, I guess so. Yeah. So same thing. You just got to force him on your podcast. Yeah. Um, so release schedule, like I said, um, the direction from the society is we want to reach outside of our echo yes, chamber yes, of yes. hunting and conservation speak because yep. we have an echo chamber. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that was very clear direction from the start is film festivals. Yeah. So let's get into festivals because that's where we start reaching into emotional places that are meant for people that don't even know that we have wild sheep in BC or Canada yeah. in general or, or anything to do with that. 
Um, so we're like all all film festivals are usually run through the end of summer, fall into okay. the winter. So it's all application time right now. So good timing. Um, yeah, it's good timing for finishing the film, not good timing to seeing the film right away. Right. So, and a lot of film festivals don't want any you publicly release. You can't release it. Yeah, first. exactly. Yeah. So instead of just having the film on complete lockdown, we're, the society we're going to work on a film tour. Okay. So first one is the Horn Aging event in, on PG, on PG, in PG, um, and uh, on the April twenty third, um, and then. I'm, I'm basically working on the film tour now. So we've got locations yeah. or just getting venues and, and dates established. Moviefree.org is the website that we're going to have to, you know, keep people up to date with the film and the film tour and when locations get um, established and, and where all things happen. And then, um, uh, yeah, just from there. Then the film tour and uh, then once we establish kind of how it's doing in festivals and where they're going, and then then we'll decide our, our public release after that. The, the beauty, one of the beauties with the festivals is that you're getting a different quality of viewers. If you yeah. just put it up on YouTube, um, you know, you might say it has 10,000 plays, but it might be 10,000 partial plays. It might be oh, yeah. 8,000 yeah. people watch only the first minute and a half, whereas, you know, it's pretty seldom that people get up and walk out of a film at a film festival, right? And yeah. and it's it's such a different, it's such a wide cast variety of people that go. Yep. that have nothing to do with this world and it's you know that's the hope is to is to just raise that knowledge and awareness with everybody with general public yeah. so yeah. this is one of my personal passion projects because if you if you do the number and let's let's just say and this is more of like in, in specific regards to hunting than wild sheep alone but let's just say five percent of north america hunts and let's say you were able to accomplish the impossible and double the hunting population Wow. Now we're at 10%. Right. We're still getting smoked yeah. on anything in the public. Yeah. But if you can take that, when we did that project for one campfire and mm -hmm. we kind of coined the term the non-hunting outdoor enthusiast, or and, and I think the analogy in this project is that the rancher or the farmer, because they have the similar love for wild spaces, yeah. love for autonomy, you know, independence, uh, you know, a respect for wilderness, all that kind of stuff. And if you can build an emotional connection with that other crowd, like you have exponentially grown yep. your political influence that you're just you're, like, you're never going to have enough sheep hunters on the planet to create a strong enough momentum to fix this problem. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that, and I, I keep saying props to wild sheep, but it, it is props to that because that was direction from the start. Yeah. And that's what like Chris Barker from the society said, festivals, because we'll reach outside of our current reach. Yeah. And so that's what we stuck to. And I think it's really, it I feel potential. like we're at a crossroads in our community. I really feel like there's a new guard and an old guard and the new guard is aware of how the real world works and right. what we need to do in order to, you know, with sophistication, communicate our message and build the allies we need to build to protect the things that we love. Mm -hmm. And then there's this old guard who kind of just doesn't want to hear it yeah. and wants to speak into the uptrack chamber because it's comfortable and it's safe and it's what they've always done. And they believe they shouldn't have to compromise. Right. Um, and I do feel like, I, I feel very optimistic about where we are, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't cynical to a certain degree. Like there's certainly challenges between here and the other side of wherever the other side is. For sure. Yeah. Well, and that speaks to, you know, conservation issues in general. It's about, you know, I think and we were talking on the way over here about how everybody wants everything black and white. Yes. They just want to have a villain to vilify and they yep. want to have a un level of understanding to just go forward with that level of understanding. And, okay, I understand it. I'm going this way. Where conservation is not that. No. It's the exact opposite of that. It's all gray. It's all nuance. It's all about just having the conversation and kind of navigating these murky waters in a collaborative and, and kind of approach to, to this. So that's just... I think what this kind of cultivates and kind of shows and, and kind of highlights as well. So yeah, that's your biggest hope with something like this is that you can, you can create enough uh, connection and motivation and inspiration with the viewer that they reach out in some way, whether it's to a hunter friend that they maybe know or just anything, anyone mm -hmm. post something about it, tell friends about it. Like anything like that is a win, right? Yep. hundred percent. And you don't, you don't get that by doing, music videos with really nice drone shots. No. And it takes way more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know you guys have a very busy day. I don't want to keep you too long. Any closing sentiments or thoughts, I'll make sure to put all the links um, 
down in the show notes, both for Filter Studios and Movie Free and Wild Sheep Society and, and, and all the rest. But anything you want to close out with? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, I think we covered thanks it. Thanks to yeah. everyone okay. involved in the project and to anyone that uh, you know sees it and has a chance to share it is going to be greatly appreciated. Yeah, and thanks for having us on. I appreciate your willingness to jump in in the tight schedule. And my 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 pleasure. I was I was quite happy when I when I got the call. And I will say to anybody listening, if this thing, because I know it's not going to be widely available for a while, if this play is playing somewhere near you, make the effort. Mm-hmm. It's super watchable. It's super enjoyable. And do your best to take somebody who who doesn't. Um, who maybe isn't a hunter or who isn't aware of. So my wife, who's a vegetarian, Mm -hmm. I got her to watch the trailer. She's a little bit pressed for time and couldn't watch the whole film. Um, When it's out for release, I'll I'll get her to watch her. And she, let me read her exact. You guys did a very good job cutting that trailer. I thought it was a bit long at first, but once I got her feedback, um, she said, this is great. Um, I was in Kelowna when they were lifting sheep out of the area because of this. So I think she actually saw some sheep getting oh, wow. long lined. And then she specifically called out the frame where that little brown sheep is jumping. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone, everyone Everybody, that watches yes, and laughs yeah, at that yeah, for some yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. great. And so, so she like literally like took a yeah. picture of that particular frame <laughs> yeah. and said, uh, yeah, loves the loves the little brown guy jumping. So, nice. yeah, yeah, she's a vegetarian. She 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 felt it. You know what I mean? Good. Yeah, I think yeah. the one other little plug to mention in that if people see the screener or if people see the trailer <laughs> and want a screening in their area to reach out and right. it's yeah. something that we would love for other people to be willing. We don't want to hold the film back from people. We just want to protect the ability to get it to audiences yeah. in, on a wider scale. Yeah, if you're in a smaller town, get your pub for a night, get in contact yeah. with one of you guys or something yeah. like that because that'd be perfect. Yeah, 4-H for, for pub members, for anything like, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and like as a as the producer, um, I'll have a screener package available so people, like I, I'll work closely with you to host it and yeah. uh, just kind of cultivate the atmosphere that we're trying to go after with this film. Yeah. And awesome. I don't know when this is going to air, but the the trailer this will, will be, be on online. Thursday. Okay, the trailer oh, yeah. will well, be online. The audio will go Thursday night, and then the video will go live Friday morning, and then right. the social right. media, you know, stuff will go up Friday morning. Okay, great. Yeah, that all sounds great. Sweet. Thanks a lot for coming in today, guys. Thank I, you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. All right. As always, if you could get, engage with the platform in any way possible, like, comment, share, subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. And as always, thanks for tuning in.